now into the final chapter of the book of Nehemiah and uh, we will see how this book ends okay but a uh, quick uh, recap of what uh, we've gone through somebody has said that if we so good if this book ends with chapter 12 uh, which is on a high and glorious note if you remember a quick recap of uh, last last week chapter 12 we uh, we saw that the city was rebuilt and the people were celebrating the uh, the sound the completion of with a grand dedication service and the sound of rejoicing and praise reaching beyond Jerusalem even from far away they can hear the the, the joy of their worship and thanksgiving. Then the chapter ended with the Levites and the priests back at their respective posts, serving the Lord in the temple, and the people bringing in their tithes and offerings. So that's how uh, chapter 12 ended. So the work was completed. Amen? Or chapter 12 but that was so taught Nehemiah but actually the city was restored the people spiritually revived but when one is dealing with the people of happy joy recurrence of sins the work is far from finished okay so from here we can understand how God feels in his dealings with the people of rebellious nature. And who is he talking about? Not just the Israelites, including you and me also, all right? <laughs> so let's be open to see what God also has to say to us. So in the final chapter of this book, we see how Nehemiah was again called to deliver his nation from a crisis and this time, a crisis more desperate than the one stemming from the collapsed walls. See, the wall is just a physical thing. It can be rebuilt. But when you talk about the inner man, the spiritual man, uh, it takes more, more work, right? So we see here, Nehemiah had returned to the Persian court after his governorship for, of 12 years. So let's do a quick... Uh, uh, run through. Huh? So in his absence, the old evils returned to the people who were gripped by permissiveness. And the chronological order of events was as follows. After 12 years of, at Jerusalem, Nehemiah returned to his post with King Artaxerxes. Remember from chapter 1, he asked for permission to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. And the king asked him, when are you coming back? So I don't know what answer did uh, Nehemiah gave him, but he was away for 12 years. So, uh, but he has promised to return, so therefore he had to return to Persia. And during his absence, the people of Israel degenerated very quickly. Right, remember chapter 12, everything was in place, but after a, a, a period of time when Nehemiah was gone, they degenerated. Okay, Nehemiah heard of the disturbing report and being moved by the same compulsion as before, as in chapter one, when he heard about the broken wall, he sought and received a second leave of absence to the same king. And thank God that God, uh, the king granted him permission to return a second time. So, in this book, he mentioned four issues that he had to deal with. The first is the desecration of the temple, or also it can relate to the priests being corrupted. Number two, the tithes were not brought in. Number three, the Sabbath rest was ignored. And number four, the people had intermarried with the foreigners. So, 
Nehemiah was very furious with the people. So he had to rebuke the people for breaking the oaths or promises they had made with God in relation to the above issues, the four issues. You see, earlier on, these people of God, they had promised. What did they promise? They had promised, to, number one, to bring their tithes and offer, offerings faithfully. This is found in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 37 to 39. They promised, they made that oath, they made a covenant with God. They will bring their tithes. Number two, they also promised to keep the Sabbath. And this is in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 31. And also number three, they promised to shun mixed marriages. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 30. These are covenants they make with God and they renew the covenant vows before God. And then we can see that in the, uh, later in the chapter, how they break each one, each one of these uh, covenant that they make with God. So let's just read the first few verses here. On that day, the book of Moses was read aloud in the hearing of the people. And it was found written that no Ammonites and Moabites should ever be admitted into the assembly of God because they had not met the Israelites with food and water, but had hired Balaam, Balaam to call a curse down on them. Our God, however, turned the curse into a blessing. When the people heard this law, they excluded from all from Israel all who were of foreign descent. Brian, is, is my sound of my voice okay, Brian? Okay. Okay. In the opening three verses, the issue of the mixed multitude was being dealt with. We see in verse 1, the people were reading the book of Moses and they found a particular passage that reminded them that Ammonites and Moabites must not be allowed to enter their community. Now, why is that so? It is because almost 1,000 years ago, when Moses was bringing the people up into the promised land, these two groups of people did not offer any help, but instead they hired the old false prophet Balaam to curse the Israelites. But the God of the Israelites turned that curse into a blessing. And because of this action, God forbade Ammonites and Moabites from entering the assembly of God's people. So the Israelites, upon reading this word, they kicked out the mixed multitude. But later on in this chapter, we will see that this mixed multitude was allowed to come back. Reading from verse 4, Before this, Elisha, the priest, had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah. Take note of this one. And he had provided him with the large room formerly used to store the grains, offerings, and incense, and temple articles, and also the types of grain, new wine, and olive oil prescribed for the Levites, musicians, and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here I learned about the evil thing Elisha had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house 
of God. I was greatly displeased and threw out threw all Tobias' household goods out of the room. I gave orders to purify the rooms and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grains, the grain offerings and the incense. In verse 4, we read that Elisha, the priest, had given permission to Tobiah, the Ammonite, to live in the temple. Now, question is, why would he do such a thing? Remember, this is the same Elisha who had worked with Nehemiah in the rebuilding of the wall in Nehemiah chapter 3. And now, he allowed Tobiah, an Ammonite, a foreigner, and Nehemiah's old enemy to enter and stay in the temple. He provided Tobiah with a large room in the temple that was to be used to store the offerings of the people and the material used for the worship. Elisha should have known better, right? But in, the, in verse 4, we see here that he was closely associated with Tobiah. In fact, other versions say that Tobiah was a relative of Elisha the priest. It seems that someone from Elisha's family had married Tobiah or someone from Tobiah's family. This is also another breach of their oath. The Jews had earlier, earlier on promised not to marry foreigners. Chapter 10 verse 30. So they had broken their promise on this count too. So the point to note here is Tobiah had gained entry into a very strategic place and that is the temple quarters itself when Nehemiah was away. And this is how Satan works, right? With subtlety, he creeps in to control strategic places in our mind and our spirit to go against our spiritual man. Therefore, we have to be very careful. That's why Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 warns us. He said, Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun set upon your anger. And verse 27 says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let him come into our life unaware. You know. So what are the things that he can creep in and uh, and uh, destroy us spiritually or or hurt us spiritually? Uh, the fourth, verse twenty six says, "Be not ang angry." So anger is one of the things that can creep into our life without us knowing, and it can bind us down. Right, so we do not give the devil a foothold. Others' uh, example would be like, for example, unforgiveness. Once we are gripped with unforgiveness, uh, we cannot move. Uh, we cannot move spiritually. We cannot grow spiritually. Uh, once we have bitterness, bitterness in our life, it will it will cause a lot of uh, of uh, turmoil in us. Uh, especially, of course, lust. Many are caught in lust because unknowingly. This just creep, creep into our life. So we have to be very careful, right? That the Tobiah don't easily come into our life. See, in verse, uh, verse 7, Nehemiah unexpectedly returned to Jerusalem. And just like the time of Moses, when Moses came down from the mountain, and what did he see? You see, the people were playing around with the golden calf. I mean, they were making a golden calf, all right? So uh, this is exactly what Nehemiah found, that these people, they were, they were uh, 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 disobedient to God and not following the law of God. So in verse 8, Nehemiah was greatly displeased and with deep, deep righteous indignation, he acted. What did he do? He personally threw out all the personal belongings of Tobiah, and nobody dare protest, not even the high priest Elisha. So he, he was uh, very swift and he was uh, very uh, strong in his action, right? Notice how he dealt with the situation. 
very harshly and very swiftly. All right. So there's no need to negotiate. He just threw everything out immediately without discussion. All right. So don't even give him time to pack. So what is the application here? Application is when dealing with sin, when dealing with sin, we don't play play. We don't play around with it. Okay? When we see sin happening, taking place in our life, we must deal with it immediately. We must recognize it and cast it out. We no need to negotiate, no need to explain, no need to rationalize. Now, sometimes we do that, no? We say, okay, we have this small sin or this pet sin or this, no, not a very serious sin. We try to explain it. We try to maybe negotiate with God. God, you know, I, I can't help it. I have to sin because of the situation. Uh, I have to lie. If not, I get into serious problem. We try to negotiate with God. We try to rationalize it, you know, and, 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 and try to reason with God. We say, why we have to sin? We have no choice. We don't do that. When we see sin, God to deal with it immediately. See, for example, what do you think are the reasons that Elashib had to allow Tobiah to come in? Can we have some response for you? You know, Elashib, he, is, he was the high priest. He knew what is right and what is wrong. And yet, he brought in uh, maybe his relative, Tobiah. Now, what do you think he has uh, as reasons to invite Tobiah to come in? Anyone? Let's say if Nehemiah were to confront Elisha and ask him, hey guy, what, what, what's happening? You know, why do you allow my old enemy to come into the temple of God and to occupy such a big storeroom also? What do you think Elisha will say? Let's play the devil's advocate, so to say, okay? <laughs> What what would Elias uh, Elisha say? Anyone? I was held ransom by this Tobia. <laughs> held ransom. Why? What did he ca uh, capture from? Because Tobia is quite a powerful guy, and uh, maybe he used his uh, relative. Excuse me, you must give me something or else. <laughs> yeah, okay. He has no choice. Elisha said, I have no choice. So, Tobiah is a VIP. Actually, you are right, uh, Brother Quack. Because uh, Elisha uh, Tobiah was a very influential guy in, in Jerusalem. If you read back the old uh, few chapters, uh, the previous chapters, uh, when he, especially when he came uh, against uh, Nehemiah, uh, he was like... Uh, very VIP around there. Okay, so in a way you are so you are right. So you are saying that he held Elisha to ransom. Huh? you better do something for me. But okay. but having said that, having said that, Elisha was not firm enough. If that is the case, he could have rebuked him, and he should know the right way. What is the right thing to do? But he didn't do that. So so he is he 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 is wrong as well. Yeah. No, we are trying to find out what kind of reason or un, uh, excuse that Elisha, uh, Elisha has uh, to, to explain why he is brought in Tobiah, okay? Anyone else? Love our enemy. Sorry? Who, somebody say something? Love our enemy. Love our enemy. <laughs> okay. So we have to show him, you know, uh, be nice to him, invite him to our house, right? Uh, even though he's our enemy. But he's the enemy of God, uh, don't forget, right? <laughs> I think if not mistaken, um, if Elisha wants to push it, uh, you can say that in the scripture, it says the Gentiles will come to the house of the Lord. <laughs> so yeah. he can push it that way. Uh. Yeah. We are, we are looking for all the excuses, huh? all right? 
Brian, what would you say if you are in leadership? He rather please the VIP over please God. Uh, okay, yeah. So actually, I don't know. I don't know what kind of excuse he has. But it's no excuse at all. He knew better, right? Than to invite this, this Tobiah into the house of God, you know? Uh, of course, the uh, like brother Quack say, he, he's, he's a relative of Tobiah. Maybe, maybe he said, uh, no, maybe Tobiah was in trouble and was kicked out by his wife, so no place to stay, have to stay in the temple. But whatever it is, you know, when we come before God, when we have sinned against God, we don't try to explain. We know we have done wrong. What should we do? We should confess our sin. Okay? We confess our sin. We don't negotiate. We don't explain our sin. We don't re rationalize our sin. We just confess our sin before God. All right? See, holiness is not negotiable. Holiness is not negotiable. No bargaining, no haggling. You want to see God, you must have holiness. Without holiness, you can't come, can't come into the presence of God. That's what it is all about. All right? So Nehemiah was harsh and sweet concerning the things that defiled the temple of God. He knew it was not right. And straight away, he took action. So another related question is, have you or have I, have you or have you knowingly or unknowingly invited a Tobiah into your house? You see, Tobiah was invited into the temple when Nehemiah was away. So perhaps, you know, we have to check ourselves. Sometimes we, we unknowingly or sometimes knowingly we allow a Tobiah to come into a house. All right? So double, uh, we have to check ourselves. And related to this question is, what is the biggest sin you have allowed back into your life? All right? It's something very personal. But I suspect, maybe like, like, like me, uh, sometimes we still like to keep a pet sin in our life, no? Okay. So we have to confront all this sin, right? And uh, we have to deal with it. When we see a Tobiah in our house, we got to get rid of it straight away. So maybe like uh, we discussed just now, what reasons would you have to keep that sin in your life, to, to continue with that sin, there's no excuse. There's no reason acceptable, right? We have to get rid of all sins in our life. We must try our very best, right? Each time we sin, each time we fall to temptation, we have to come before God and say, we repent, we confess, and we purify ourselves that way, okay? So we see Nehemiah was harsh and swift concerning the things that defile the temple of God. In verse 9, it shows how he dealt with the decontamination. All traces of evil must be removed. Therefore, he gave orders to purify the room. And the purification was by washing, scrubbing, and sprinkling with blood. Then only the chambers were restored to their original use. Sounds like dealing with the virus, right? There's complete sanitization must take place. Verse 10, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So we see here Nehemiah next discovered that the people were not bringing their tithes to the temple, a direct violation of another part of the covenant that they had made with God. And this was the reason why a temple storage chamber was available for Tobiah. It had become empty because the people had not been bringing in their offerings. So, what is the application here? This is a spiritual lesson on an empty room. You see? They, people did not bring in the, their, their tithes and offerings, so the storage room was empty. 
So when you have an empty room like that, when if it's not filled with the things of God, then what will happen? Carnal and evil things will rush in and affect us in our minds and our spirit. Therefore, we must be very careful that we don't have empty rooms uh, that are not filled, uh, that, that, that is empty, so uh, that evil and carnal things can, can influence us and come into these empty rooms that we have. Now we can understand why Nehemiah is so furious about Tobiah being allowed to enter into the temple. Because once he gets in, he can cause a lot of damage. He can influence the people negatively. All right? So verse 11 on us, uh, So I rebuked the officials and asked them, what, Why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought their tithes of grain, new wine, and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Selimiah, the priest, Sadok, the scribe, and a Levite named Padiah in charge of the storerooms and make Hanan, son of Saku, the son of Mataniah, their assistant. Because they will consider what? Trustworthy, right? They will make responsible for dis distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have faithfully done for the house of my God and his services. So the issue here is that the people have stopped bringing in their tithes and their offerings to the temple. And because there weren't enough grains for the Levites and singers, they were forced to work on their own fields to support themselves. The priests are likely affected too because they survived on the tithes from the Levites. This neglect resulted in those who were responsible for the temple worship having to leave their posts to earn a living in the fields. Now clearly, the temple worship was compromised, if not abandoned. Therefore, Nehemiah had to rebuke them. Why is the house of God neglected? It is the exact opposite of what they promised in chapter 10, verse 39, part B. They say, we will not neglect the house of God. You see, all they wrote in chapter 10 will compromise in chapter 13. Now, after Nehemiah had rebuilt the leaders, he restores everything back. He recalled the Levites and stationed them at their posts. And he got the people to bring in their tithes and offerings again. With the inflow of offerings coming in and the Levites and singers back on duty, the temple worship continued without interruption. Nehemiah then reappointed new gatekeepers or treasurers over the storehouses. He selected Selemiah, the priest, Sato, the scribe, and a Levite named Padaiah, and Hanan, son of Sako, to be responsible for distributing the supplies to their brothers. See, four men were appointed, a priest, a scribe, a Levite, and an assistant, a layman. The only thing they had in common is this, they are all trustworthy and reliable. And that's what he needs. And in verse 14, Nehemiah uttered a prayer unto God. He is actually calling God to God to forgive the people and give them another chance since the people resume bringing in their tithes and offerings. So what is the application here? We must be faithful in our giving of tithes and offerings, lest we neglect the house of God. 
So this is talking about you not know, giving of our tithes and offering. We must not neglect and we must be faithful. You know? uh, this is again reminding us uh, what it was stated in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 10. It says, we were mere mortal rob God. So if we don't bring in our tithes properly, we are actually robbing God, he says. Huh? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. And verse 10, bring the whole tithe to, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be no room enough to store it. Amen? Any one of us here has a, a, a short testament to share about tidings and offering? Anyone? How God bless you as you uh, being faithful to bring in your tithes and offering. Anyone? To give you a quick few minutes to share, to encourage the rest of us. Okay, I'll start first. Now, for a long time after I become a Christian, uh, this is one issue that I always struggle with. You know, earlier on, when I became a Christian, I was just uh, early 20s. And I was working as a, uh, in a in a in a in an accounting firm and all this. So um, money is quite tight, and to give ten percent of that to God, you know, that was a real struggle. And as I go on later on in life as a Christian, that was still an issue for me. Um, I sometimes being very faithful, I give the full amount of ten percent, but sometimes I also uh, hold back a bit. Until when I, I, I did my, my business in the year 2000, when I started the college. Initially, we were struggling a lot. Then slowly, we were picking up after uh, uh, one or two years, and the Lord really blessed us. And that time, I was still trying to, you know, to struggle. Then, then the Lord convicted me. He said, you are, you'll be faithful in your tidings. And these words came to me. Then I will open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there be no enough room to store it. It came to me, you know, uh, uh, when I heard one message. So it challenged me. I, I said to God, yes, God, I will put my faith in you. I will obey your word. And from that year onwards, uh, the business picked up very well. And, and uh, I have no problem after that. And truly, God, God bless me, manifold. Even if I get, I give the 10%, the full 10%, God bless me plentifully. And I want to encourage each one of you, just trust God. You know, if you struggle in this area, have faith in God and claim the promise here that as you, as you give faithfully and trust God, God will provide. Amen? Anyone else want to just share a quick one? All right, if not, we move on. Eh? So in verse 15, in those days I saw people in Judah trading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. Verse 17, I rebuke the nobles of Judah and say to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing? Desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating 
the seven. Very strong words here. The next thing Nehemiah dealt with was the restoration of the Sabbath. He was distressed to see evidence of the Sabbath desecration. In the towns and villages outside the city, the Jews were trading wine presses on Sabbath. Others were loading their donkeys with all kinds of products and bringing them to Jerusalem to sell and buy. Nehemiah warned them against this practice. He instructed them not to sell food. Sabbath was not just for rest, but also an expression for trust that the Lord will provide when we are resting in His presence. The Jews were not only breaking their oath, but also the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment says, what? Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Nehemiah went directly to the nobles who were governing the city and who bore responsibility for the profaning of the Sabbath. He warned them on the, of the consequences of failure to keep the Sabbath, more so when they had made an oath to keep it. Verse 19, When the evening shadows fell on the gates of Jerusalem before the Sabbath, I ordered the doors to be shut and not open until the Sabbath was over. I stationed some of the, uh, my own men at the gates so that no load could be brought in on the Sabbath day. Once or twice, the merchants and sellers of all kinds of goods spent the night outside Jerusalem. But I warned them and said, Why do you spend the night by the wall? If you do this again, I will arrest you. From that time on, they no longer came on the Sabbath. Then I commanded the Levites to purify themselves and go and guard the gates in order to keep the Sabbath day holy. Apparently, the nobles were unmoved by Nehemiah's passionate appeal. He therefore took immediate charge of the situation by ordering the heavy main gates of Jerusalem to be closed from Friday evening to Saturday evening. He posted some of his private servants at the gates to see that they remained closed on the Sabbath and that no one smuggled in any merchandise. But the merchants did not return to their homes. They came outside the walls and set up their stalls there tempting the townspeople to go out to them the next day. Now this rebellious behavior aroused Nehemiah's anger. He vigorously denounced them and warned them that if they hung around on the outskirts of the walls again on the Sabbath, he would personally arrest them. So in verse 21, we see that they, that make them turn away. Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah who had married women from Esau, Ammon, and Moab. Half their children spoke the language of Esau, or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language, language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them Speak an oath in God's name and say, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like this that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations, there were no king like him. He was loved by God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. 
must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women. From verse 23 to verse 27, we see Nehemiah had to deal with the issue of mixed marriages. Later on, while on the tour of the remote frontiers of Judah, he discovered to his great dismay that some of the Jews had married women of Ammon, Moab, and the Philistine city of Esau. This practice is actually forbidden by the law of Moses. You see, God had ordered the people not to marry foreigners. He had also ordered the Jews not to allow the Ammonites and Moabites to join them. Nehemiah 13 verse 1 and 2 The people had promised God that they would not marry foreigners in uh, chapter 10 and verse 30. Uh, this was an, another promise to God that the people had broken. The situation was serious because the children of these mixed marriages could not even speak Hebrew, the language of the Jews. How then could they be instructed in the law at home or in the synagogue? Thus, they would not be able to read or to understand God's law. It would be very easy for them to start to worship the false gods of other nations. So as God has war so warned, mixing with foreigners will lead them astray into idolatry and apostasy. Not just for their generation, but also for the generation that comes after. That is why Nehemiah was so furious. And in his holy anger, Nehemiah became very physical. He struck the transgressors and pulled out their hair. This is very similar to the incident of Jesus at the temple where he drove out the merchants and traders. And this is the same expression of holy anger. Jesus even used a whip. Now again, this is dealing with serious sin and there is no holding back. Determined to prevent reoccurrence of this practice, Nehemiah made them swear that there is no more mixed marriages that will be contracted. Now, in order to warn the Jews of the consequences of such a serious sin, Nehemiah used the sad illustration of Solomon, a uniquely honored and divinely chosen king, who nonetheless was caused to sin by the foreign women he married. Now, the consequences of Solomon's sin was that the nation was divided into two nations, a tragedy from which they had never recovered. And Nehemiah asked, should the same sin that had brought God's judgment in a previous generation now be tolerated? So, some questions here. The King Solomon was a wise king, right? He asked God for the gift of wisdom and God granted him. But even a wise king was not wise enough to, to know how to avoid the sin of uh, marrying a foreign women. So this is a very serious uh, form of attack upon us. And that's why so much uh, is stressed on this uh, idea of non-intermarriage, non-mixing of intermarriage within uh, foreign uh, women. But in the modern day context, can Christian marry non-Christian? A very, is it a sensitive question, sensitive issue? Can I have some response here? I don't think we have too much time to deal with, but let's see what we can uh, share from here. All right? Can Christian marry non-Christian?
Anyone? Sensitive yes. issue. Sensitive issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, and, and I don't think we can address this uh, issue in the time frame given here, all right? But just to have some food for thought here, um, can or not? I think the answer is can, right? Because anyone can do what they want, right? Okay, if I choose to marry a non-Christian, I can. The question is, the actual question is, should I, right? Should I do it? Huh? Uh, what does the Bible say? Well, in the Old Testament, it's very straightforward, okay? You cannot marry uh, people of other faith or foreigners, okay? That will, uh, because of what we have just read, it will have a, a very drastic uh, impact on us. And in the New Testament, I think they say something about being unequally yoked, all right? So, uh, is it breaking the law? Is it going against the word of God? Uh, there's something that uh, I think each one of us, you know, uh, easy for us to say, but if we are caught in the situation, you know, uh, I, I think it will be a big uh, struggle, all right? So maybe, uh, maybe I can make this as an assignment to end up the Bible study on the book of Nehemiah. Because uh, early on, I was talking to Brother God Mao, it says that we will have a test. Uh, so I give you an assignment, all right? Anyone to do an assignment? A final exam for this Bible study series on the book of Nehemiah. Each one of you can just uh, write a, a, a short thesis or a, a report on what you think, you know? And then you send it to Brian, okay? <laughs> and then we will, uh, we will produce the report and see. Uh, what what you all think about it, and uh, maybe we can compile a, a short report after this. Okay, uh, some homework for each one of us here. Okay, let's move on. Verse twenty eight. One of the sons of Joida, son of Elashib, again Elashib, nah? the high priest was son in law to son Balat, the horror knight. Okay, horror knight. Okay. And I drove him away from me. Okay. Then verse 29, I will quickly read through. Remember then, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign and assigned them duties each to his own task. Verse 31, I also make provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits, the tithes and offerings again. And the last phrase, the last sentence here, remember me with favor, my God. And this is the prayer of Nehemiah. And here we see that Elisha, the chief priest, is being mentioned again. This time it tells about his grandson who had married a daughter of Sanballat. Do you remember Sanballat? He was one of the enemies of the Jews. He had tried to stop the Jews from building the walls of Jerusalem again. Remember in Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10 and 19 in chapter 4 verse 1 and 2. Now probably Nehemiah was very angry because Sanballat was now a relative of the chief priest. So Nehemiah drove this grandson away. From verses 29 to 31, we see Nehemiah make a prayer again. He knew that the priests had not obeyed God. They had not been good models for the people. Nehemiah tried to make the priests and the Levites do the right things again. He purified them by removing everything foreign from them. He arranged for each one of them to do his own proper tasks. He made sure that the people would collect the tithes and the gifts at the right time. We see in verse 31 that Nehemiah ended his book with another prayer. 
his final prayer. Nehemiah had always tried to do what is right. He only wanted to please God, and he asked God to show his kindness. Nehemiah, who lived his entire life in God's presence and who earnestly desired his approval on all his actions, pleaded to be remembered with blessings, not only for the short remainder days of his life on earth, but also for the life to come. So we see here, Nehemiah left something impactful for us. He did what was necessary, important, and most of all, godly, in terms of obeying God's will. He left a lasting legacy, and we are still reading his story today. He has been consistently faithful to God from chapter 1 to chapter 13, totally committed to obeying God and doing His will. He did not give in to sin. He did not give room for sin to grow. He stood by God's way, whether against enemies without or within. And he did it with boldness and courage. And we also see Nehemiah's passion for God's glory remains undiminished with time. We see his heart for God's city, God's temple, God's law, and God's people. And this is the kind of servant we should strive to be, right? To be the right man at the right place, at the right time, to do the right thing. Amen? So we can all learn to be a Nehemiah today. Watch what we are leaving behind. At the end of the day, we do not just want to leave our name on the, on the tombstone. We want to carve it in the lives of the people that we have impacted for Christ. Amen. So that ends our series in the book of Nehemiah. So I pass the time to Pastor Lim, if you can just pray for us. So there's a there's a question I, I just want to uh, to ask uh, Peter Tam. I mean, uh, what strikes me was uh, why is it that uh, Elisha was not cast out by Nehemiah? I mean, he was a source of two of the key issues that we saw. So why didn't he? Why did Nehemiah cast out Eli Elisha? Yeah, uh, that thought did occur, but I was. Trying to pace out the uh, the the lesson tonight, uh, so I didn't have much time to think through. Okay, maybe maybe we could take one or two minutes. Anyone want to attempt to to answer that question? Brother, brother Franco, are you there? What do you think? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I think we have to close it. So my, my thoughts uh, is that perhaps um, Nehemiah still respect the, the man of God, right? Uh, even though they sin, right? I mean, this is just my thought now, huh? that uh, he's still more more understanding more lenient right uh, and maybe he gives him another chance but he has done some very terrible things okay uh, so i think that he could be more compassionate to the, the the people who serve god because he is a high priest so i don't know whether you you agree with that thought how about brother terence what do you think? Oh, just to follow up, I didn't have an answer until you start talking. So, but when you said what you said, it reminded me of David and Saul. I will not touch the Lord's anointed. So, I also don't know the answer lah to Kok Mao's a very good 
good question. But maybe uh, vengeance belongs to the Lord. <laughs> and then uh, Nehemiah just let him be eh? That's I don't know. Yeah, true. Uh, Brian, you got any thoughts on that? <laughs> maybe if uh, he throw in the ship, he throw the whole the whole Israel out of the place. <laughs> That's just kidding. <laughs> Everyone get, get kicked out. Huh? Okay, I think we have to end the session now. So, uh, thank you for the question, Brother Kotma. Interesting. I wish we had more time, then we can discuss other issues. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I think this is an important question we could address some other time. Some other time. Yeah, we should address some other time. It does, it does, it does call into question uh, the, pastoral, the pastoral role. Yeah. And, 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 and I do understand what Karen says, but I think uh, there are issues that maybe the leadership uh, maybe uh, debate, deliberate, and, and, and have a stand on how, how we should take this yeah. forward because yeah. these are real issues in this modern world right. where, where, where there are so many uh, Tobaya and uh, Sambala in our midst. Yes, very true. Thank you, Brother Gama. Pastor Lee, would you like All right. to? All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Peter, uh, for leading us and initiating. And I also want to express my appreciation to Terence as well uh, to, uh, as we lead uh, and study the book of the Haimaya together.